Hi, everyone. Welcome to my talk on um, assuring data quality at scale. Um, this is going to be normal conference talk format. After this morning's keynote, I feel compelled to set the expectation. Um, but I'm going to be sharing my experience in building a data quality platform um, at Expedia. Data quality has always been relevant um, in the data world, but why so or more so now, um, particularly with the advent of data mesh? Um, so we'll be talking about that a little bit. Um, what approach we took in solving that um, for the scale at which Expedia is operating, um, some of the opportunities and challenges, and I hope to conclude with some observations from my end. I am Gayatri Tiaharajan. I'm a senior engineering manager at Expedia Group, which is one of the um, online travel platform, as you know. If you have booked your tickets through Expedia to come here, thank you. Um, I have um, 17 years of experience in the industry. My background is Java engineering. Um, I worked in various microservices and distributed system-based projects, applied DDD principles in almost all of them. Of course, I'm a huge evangelist and advocate of DDD, which is why I'm here. Um, I've done quite a few public talks with Andrew, who's sitting in the front row, um, and on, on similar topics. I published an article on um, visual collaboration tools about a field story based on my experience building clickstream data product. Um, and um, I've written a few blogs as well. In the last four years, um, I have worked on various data products in Expedia. More recently, I lead our um, internal managed Kafka infrastructure platform capability, and I've also been part of building the data quality capability, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, being in this room, I feel, again, compelled to put this warning on some of the terminologies that I'm going to be using. If you're experienced in working with data, you'd probably understand that quite immediately. Um, but if you come from traditional applications development background, you'll find this useful. So when I say pipeline, I don't mean a Jenkins CI CD pipeline. I mean a data pipeline, which processes, does ETL on data um, and lands it in data lake or similar place. And when I talk about metrics, I talk about data quality metrics, and we'll cover that in detail, um, not system or application metrics or operational metrics. And when I call checks, it's the um, semantic uh, rule-based checks that you run on these metrics. But when I say application, it is application as with everything else. Let me set the scene um, first. So Expedia as an organization has been going through a transformation journey. Um, if you know the background, Expedia is made of the, the group itself is uh, comprised of many, many brands, um, 20 plus, but three major brands. Um, but we have been going through this journey of consolidation, optimization, and modernizing our tech stack in the last three years. What we've been doing is aligning our business products along the lines of domain all the way through to infrastructure, um, and also centralizing some of our runtime platform and the toolings that we are using across the company. Whilst we were doing that, it kind of made sense to extend that concept and apply that to the data domain as well. So we've been grouping the data products along with those domains and um, making sure that you have clear delineation of domains at the data um, within every single place that we store that data or use the data, um, and also centralizing the ca capabilities around data as well. So where before we had a diverse set of data products, mostly divided um, by brands rather than domains which are common across these brands, um, we lacked consistency and standardization of the tooling, technology framework that we're using, terminologies, um, and approaches as well in some cases. So all of a sudden, when we brought all of these data products um, and wanted to separate them purely based on the domains, we were suddenly looking at a much, much higher scale at which we were solving these problems of building these central capabilities. So that is the scale that I'm going to be um, addressing today. In this backdrop, um, we were also shipping a lot of new data products to production, a lot of them multi-million dollars worth. Um, but we had no idea of the data quality, um, quality of the data that they were producing and um, the data products that were dependent on this data. 
So it's just what prompted us to build a, a capability of, um, uh, to solve this problem. So let's just briefly look at what I mean by data quality so we are on the same page. So data is the lifeblood of um, any data-driven organization, by which I mean data is integral to every part of the org, every division depends on the data to make key business decisions and drive insights, and they're all purely driven by data. But yet what we found was a lot of these teams, the products that they were building, the stakeholders, they had no idea. They were literally flying blind with no idea of um, what, how good is the data that they were reliant on. And there was no guarantees on this data in terms of validity or timeliness of the data. But also for the engineers, data engineers and data scientists, um, what it means is having poor quality data meant they have to wake up in the middle of the night solving P1 issues in production. When a pipeline breaks, it becomes more complex um, when you deal with data because you have a lineage of data pipelines flowing through across multiple data products, and you don't know which part the malicious data actually got in. So you find time, a lot of time actually digging through that. Um, and also, you have to reprocess all of that data, usually in the order of millions of rows or events, um, which becomes more complex when you're talking about streams. So overall, it's very painful and important to know that you have good data flowing through your pipelines. So we needed a capability, or multiple capabilities sometimes, to provide reliable and trustworthy data um, for any organization that generally depends on data for its success, right? So it is important um, for insightful data analytics um, and also how you estimate the relevance of the decisions that you're making. So that's almost the data quality is a direct measure of the relevance of the decisions, business decisions that your organization is making. On top of this, as I mentioned, um, we as one of the medium to large scale enterprise have, um, we are moving billions of events, millions of data, um, and a lot of terabytes of data through our pipeline streams and um, landed in Data Lake. So we're talking about huge scale here, right? So any small, medium, large organization, they are very much focused on collecting as much data as they can. So we're talking about really big scale at which we have to solve this problem. Imagine running multiple um, microservices, and you have no idea, no metrics to tell you how healthy they are, how they're operating. That's a pretty scary picture coming from application development background as well. So why would you run a lot of pipelines with no metrics on them to tell you how good is the data that is actually flowing through the pipeline, how healthy is the pipeline, and what is the um, status of these pipelines? So there is a need to do this centrally and at scale to provide the level of transparency, consistency, and standardization that any organization would expect. So let's just quickly look at how these issues normally manifest themselves, which also gives us an indication of the number of metrics and the measures that you would need to calculate in order to detect them, identify them, and report on them. So these are I'm not sure it's very clear, but um, apologies for that. So these are some of the live data quality issues that I have grabbed from our um, data products deployed and running in production. But these are just the root causes, right? They don't actually tell you what the consequence of having these data quality issues is actually um, for the customers or the stakeholders. This could actually range from um, broken pipelines or outages to customer features not working on live site by using streaming data to provide recommendations or personalization. So this could actually directly impact um, customer experience and you could lose customers if you're running um, an online platform or website. So it's also... Um, Worth mentioning here that there could be legitimate drift in data because the customer patterns have changed over a period of time or suddenly. Um, and this could very much look like bad quality data because the models are gonna react in fairly similar way, but you need to be able to differentiate that in any tooling that you're using. 
Well, let's just group these commonly occurring data quality issues into categories. Right? So they broadly fall into one of these four buckets. First one is incomplete data. Um, so ETL pipelines and uh, stream processing applications normally expect a certain level of completeness in the data that they are consuming in order to find the data useful for their business purpose, right? So incomplete data normally leads to um, the pipelines dropping that data, um, or um, sometimes it becomes uh, unusable if it exceeds a certain um, threshold. So you don't have enough data to actually make much sense out of. So this normally results in you having to reprocess the data in the scale of millions of rows. Um, as I mentioned before, stream processing, reprocessing the data is real pain in the backside. Um, and uh, in some domains like finance or tax, uh, even a small amount of incomplete data is unacceptable. You have to hold somebody accountable for telling you why you're missing data. Next one is um, incorrect data. So this is when um, the, uh, the data itself violates an expected pattern, um, be it in the format of the data or in the regex pattern that you expect. Um, and this normally goes down two ways. One is, again, it gets filtered out in the pipeline, so they kind of filter the data out and you drop the data. Or more seriously, this kind of trickles down and depends on the kind of monitoring and validations these pipelines already have. But more seriously, if it actually gets through those filters, this can impact the downstream business decisions because you're now making decisions based on uh, a data that is invalid. Like, for example, marketing spend calculation or product performance metrics where you're looking at um, funnel, funnel analysis or conversion rate, visit count, um, number of unique visitors to your website um, over a period of time. So all of these would be impacted because you're actually gaining that information from wrong data. Uh, of course, one major application is AI and ML. Um, so obviously, incorrect data means you're model is trained against something very different to what it is actually seeing in production. So this could lead to invalid or incorrect, sometimes irrelevant personalization or recommendation. And if you go on any website and you see nonsensical recommendations given to you, of course, you're not going to be inclined to visit that website again. So it's very important in terms of customer experience as well that we identify this. Um, so late arriving data where, for example, um, you have an application which joins multiple sources of data and um, you're doing this in real time as well, and one source fails to arrive on time, so you're having to hold that data up, buffer it, or um, having to reprocess that at a later point in time. So all of these complications when you have more complex pipeline um, with late arriving data. Uh, and secondly, if you have like a chain of pipelines which um, expects the input to be an output of the previous pipeline or an application that um, is dependent on the data having been processed and available in data lake, for example. So all of that's going to be affected if the data doesn't arrive on time. And finally, data mismatch. Um, so this is when there is a difference between source and the destination data. So this is directly related to uh, data loss in transit. Um, and um, in normally in ETL pipelines and stream transformations, unless you have filters because your business logic uh, expects you to, the expectation is you receive the same number of rows as output as that you got in um, right. If you don't, then the biggest question is, are we losing data? If so, by how much? So let's look at how do you measure data quality and how do you use that measure in order to detect and alert? Because alerting is the key part, right? So just measuring is not going to tell you that there is a problem. So data quality is often um, used as a fitness for use principle. So this, I think, um, conveys the subjectivity of this concept. And it's a multidimensional concept as well, where each aspect, single aspect, is described by a data quality dimension, for example, completeness or timeliness, freshness, validity, and so on. 
And a data quality metrics is a function that maps a dimension, such as completeness, to a numerical value. So let's take completeness as an example. Um, so it's a loss function of the total number of rows or events um, that are normally expected to arrive within a period of time. Right? So that's how you express and calculate um, these data quality dimensions. And you can calculate these metrics at various different aggregation levels. Um, so it could be done at the data set level or tuple or row level or attribute or field level within an event, depending on whether you're looking at data at rest or streaming data. So let's just briefly look at what these dimensions and the definitions of these dimensions are, because it's quite important when we come to um, the, the aspects of data quality that I was just touching on. So completeness is um, normally defined as the breadth, depth, and scope of information that is comprised within uh, a data set. And it also covers the condition where uh, if the data is, is absent, it's also considered as incomplete. And you can um, count these at the data set level by number of items or um, uh, data items or rows that is missing. And at the row or attribute level, you can compute this as a function of um, number of null values. So all of that um, add up to calculating what the completeness of the overall data set or a field or an attribute is. So this is a simple formula that um, we have used to calculate based on the metrics that we have computed, which is the number of incomplete elements or the number of um, total number of elements that is a function of um, completeness. So next one is accuracy, and I think this is one of the most important dimension um, for expressing the quality of data. It is described as the closeness of an information system, the data that is stored within an information system, to the real world. Um, this could actually um, reflect the data mismatch. Um, for example, if you have, or if you're expecting 1,000 bookings, but you only have about 996 bookings. So that kind of contributes towards, um, or is a function of um, what this dimension represents. So normally, you wouldn't have an objective way of um, knowing what is the real world like, right? Because information systems are more often the source of truth. So we calculate the accuracy by comparing multiple information systems or data stores to come up with this accuracy value. So cross data set um, uh, correlation deviation is a good way of capturing the accuracy of data. So that's a simple formula for calculating what an accuracy is, but you would find in the literature that there's many, many ways, many more complex ways to actually compute this, which is far more relevant to what, what your domain represents. Um, so the third dimension is uh, consistency. So this captures the um, violation of semantic rules defined on um, data items. Again, you can do that over uh, row level tuple, or, or at the individual column or attribute level. Referential integrity is, is one example where you expect, um, say for example, a particular column to contain um, uh, a certain value that is also referred in another table. So referential integrity, for example, is, is a good way of expressing how consistent is this, is this data. And for this particular dimension, there is certain amount of uh, domain knowledge that is expected um, before you can define what this dimension is or how this is computed. It's a fairly complex, I'm not gonna actually go into this describing what this formula represents, but you can, you can refer to this um, from the slides later. And last one, um, is timeliness, so this captures how um, current is the data for the task at hand, and it's normally um, related to the notions of currency, which is how frequently does the data get updated, um, and also volatility, how quickly does the data get stale. Normally we use um, the inverse of latency to also capture the timeliness of the data. There are more dimensions like freshness, validity, and um, other aspects as well to describe quality of the data, but these are the four key dimensions that's normally used widely. 
So this is an important call out. Um, so it's important that we talk about the subjective as well as the objective nature of um, data quality metrics, right? So the dimension that we saw just now, completeness, timeliness, um, accuracy, and consistency, these are called hard dimensions, which means these are objective measures. It doesn't quite change um, depending on who's actually looking at that information, um, regardless of the observer. For a data set, these dimensions are fairly constant. So these are objective measures that describe the quality of the data set on a whole. But there are also soft dimensions, um, which are the subjective measures, where you, know, you can think about these as business rules or validations that you want to run. And they very much dependent on um, the application that you're building. For example, I'm training a model that is looking at the age group of children for a family who are booking their hotel. Um, so I'm specifically concerned about the the children age information that is captured, and I want to set a threshold that this is between zero and 10. And if I get a value of, say, 90, I want to be alerted that that is wrong, right? And that is very much specific to my use case because that's important to the model that I'm training. So these are very much subjective. And you can also think about the, the duplication rules. And they are very specific to the application um, or the processing application or pipeline that you're building. So again, a subjective um, uh, measure of what good quality data is for you or for your team. Um, so just put together this diagram to show this in more um, in, in a clearer way. So as you can see, there are the data producers on the left, extreme left, who um, are normally responsible for uh, producing data against a uh, set contract. They can be internal applications or external third parties, um, and they are expected to produce the data on time at an expected frequency, and again, um, against a, a contract or a schema that they have agreed with the consumers or that they have actually declared and um, publicized. And then on the extreme right are the consumers of the data. Um, so they extract, transform, load, process the data, consume the data, build applications around that data or web features around this data. Um, they are normally on the receiving end of all the quality issues. So mostly these teams put their own guardrails against the data that they have um, or that they use uh, in order to protect, protect their application. And finally, in the middle, or the owners of the data, um, most cases, data producers or the data owners, but not necessarily. Clickstream is an example where you have multiple producers, and there's usually one team that owns that data set and um, is responsible for meeting the SLAs and SLOs of this data. So this clearly shows, like, so as a producer, my um, view of the quality of the data that I'm producing is very different to what a consumer, and that could be multiple consumers of the same data set. Again, if you use Clickstream, it's widely used for various different use cases, modeling, analytics, reporting, marketing, um, and all of them having different expectations on um, the, the quality of the data, right? So what is good for me as a, a marketing spend analyst is very different to what an ML um, engineer would expect from the same data set. So this, I think, shows the spectrum of the, um, the subjectivity nature of data quality as, as a concept. So I hope that was a useful primer for what's about to, to come, um, kind of setting the scene to uh, describe the, the scale at which we are looking at this problem, not just in the quantity of the data, but also the problem that we are solving, which is how do we actually measure these, um, both subjectively and objectively, in a centralized format that caters to all kinds of sources of data. Well, let's just briefly look at um, the data architecture and how it's evolved um, over a period of time. Um, Expedia, like any other organizations, had legacy data lake, data warehouse-based 
solutions in the past. Um, and as I said, initially, we have been moving our data products and building new data products um, in, in more modernized stacks. We are moving more towards stream-based approach, um, which powers a lot of AI and ML um, use cases and features, which improves our customer experience as well. And we've been proud to do that. Um, so as we see this evolution, there is one particular concept in the last couple of years that's become really famous and um, really popular, which is, of course, the data mesh, right? So this puts data right at the center rather than being like the second class citizen, which is the mentality and the attitude that's been even when I started like three, four years ago, um, uh, where data is almost like an afterthought. I think data mesh has pushed data into the forefront and has a nice framework and structure to how you work around data. So let's just quickly look at what, what this concept is about. Right? So data mesh is a uh, concept that was uh, introduced by Zamak from ThoughtWorks. I don't know if she's listening or here in this hall. If so, forgive me. Um, so it's a socio-technical approach, a decentralized approach for sourcing, managing, and accessing data and um, for powering use cases at scale. Scale is, is a key word and operating word there. It advocates well-defined boundaries, um, encapsulating applications and the data that these applications produce, making it part of um, the, the product itself. And for those of us coming from domain-driven design um, world, we, it resonates well with us, right? This is what bounded context is about. This is what the domain boundaries is about, well-defined APIs. And we've been talking about this for years already. Um, so this is almost like common sense for us. The product owners are responsible for the, the data that they are produced. So this clearly defines the ownership of the data. But along the way, data mesh has also surfaced some of the challenges from the traditional way of thinking about data and the data architecture previously, which is the ability to discover, understand, and use and trust quality data, right? So how do you know that the data that is being produced as you have decentralized is reliable, is trustworthy? So this is one of the key objectives of um, data mesh. And the scale that we're talking about here is defined, A, based on the change in landscape, um, particularly in data. There's like streams which we haven't actually thought about like five, six years ago. Um, and that's really pushing the limits of what you can do with, with data near real time. And now data that's older than like few minutes is that's like, um, we are like, why? why? What do you do with that data, right? Of course, it's useful in some analytics use cases, but most of the application you want to do, they, you want to use the data in near real time. And then there is a proliferation of producers and consumers of data, gone or you know, the old school way of re generating reports, Tableau dashboards, Power BI dashboards to look and pour over um, terabytes of data, but now you want to consume that, consume that quickly and do something with that. Um, and then there is a diversity of transformation and processing. There's so many new technologies that's come up um, that makes it so much easier as well. There is uh, Flink for stream processing and there are so many technologies for streaming, Pulsar, Kafka. Um, and that changes that landscape as well. And you want to provide um, uh, you know, very speedy response to your customers. If they are struggling to use some of the features on, on your website, you want to know immediately. But how do you know immediately? You gather all that data and make it available over a stream and have something that did you consume that data and respond appropriately. That's a much better customer experience than knowing about it like 10 days after you have actually lost that customer. So these are the key um, principles that Data Mesh um, mainly advocates. So calling out the domain-oriented, decentralized data ownership and architecture, data as a product or as part of the product um, within, within the domain boundaries, self-serve data platform, which is what I'm going to be focusing on more, and then finally federated governance capabilities. So how does this tie back to the topic of data quality? 
So here, ownership of data quality has significantly shifted towards the left, that is the producers that we saw in the previous diagram, because they are the data owners, they are the product owners, they are the producers of that data. So they have the responsibility for producing good quality data. It advocates for building platform capabilities that work and operate at scale. And then it covers a subjective specification of data quality criteria. So you need to cater to the subjective um, rules depending on the domain which is processing that data. That's how you attain domain autonomy, true domain autonomy. And then objective measures are important as well for governance purposes. Because I want to look at a particular data set and tell you whether it's fit for purpose for any use case. But there are certain um, high quality dimensions by which, uh, sorry, high level dimensions by which I can tell you whether this data is fit for any use. And then finally, well matured capabilities over um, non transparent and unsupportable solutions. And we'll cover that a little bit more of how the landscape of data quality was before we introduced the central capability. So how did, we, how did we build this? And more importantly, how did we scale this? So I need to tell you that it's a huge space, mainly because it overlaps with a lot of concepts which look at similar metrics for various different purposes, right? So there is data drift, there is feature drift, ML ops, validation, there is measurement, lineage. Yes, all of this requires the metrics that we talked about, um, but they're not exactly solving for data quality problem. So whatever it is that um, you want to solve, and it could be any of these as a central capability, it's very important to define the scope of that capability and stick to it. Even though there are many, many overlaps, for example, uh, exploratory data analysis uses the same set of metrics to describe the data for mostly analysis and uh, data science purposes, but it doesn't quite detect or alert or monitor quality issues and it doesn't tell you about the quality of the data flowing through pipeline. So it's different, even though the building blocks are pretty much the same. So what should an effective data quality um, monitoring capability have? So first and foremost, before we even talk about the capability, the dimensions and metrics that I talked about um, previously, so that needs to be standardized and standardized for your organization. So there needs to be a common definition for what do you call as accuracy? What is it that I'm comparing, right? So that needs to be written down, defined, and ratified with all the key stakeholders. Because as an objective measure, when I say this data set is accurate, what is it that I mean? And that has to be common across everybody who's looking at that data. It should support um, any central capability, should support uh, all kinds of sources of data that is in use within an organization. So it's not just data lake, it's not just data warehouse, it's not just streams, it could have NoSQL, SQL data sources, Elasticsearch, Mongo, Cassandra, MySQL. So you should be able to run this quality checks because all of that data is important too um, in the same standardized way. And they should all output the same set of metrics. They should all report it in the same way and alert the same way. Um, yeah, alerting and notification is a key part of data quality capability because that is the part that is going to be actioned and exposed to the customers. Uh, and it is important that these alerts are accurate as well because I have worked on many products that look at these operational metrics and send out alerts, but as soon as these alerts are uh, less accurate, it becomes very noisy and people start to ignore it. So the accuracy of these alerts are very important to the success of the product and capability itself. And the, it's important that the measurement of these metrics and dimensions are done centrally and that doesn't vary with your data source. Um, and they are done in a transparent way and they are surfaced um, and made available in any data discoverability tool, wherever you're using and consuming this data in a central way. Um, so before we actually embarked on building the capability in-house, um, obviously we looked around to see what's out there. 
um, in the market. There are quite a few, um, and there is a reason why we built, decided to actually build this in-house as well, because a lot of these tools, while they are good at solving one problem, wasn't quite what we were looking for in terms of addressing the data mesh pattern of providing that central capability that addresses all kinds of sources of data. For example, Apache Griffin works really well with um, batch data, batch processing pipelines. Um, it's open source. Again, you have AWS DQ, which is an open source library uh, that you plug into your pipeline and bake it into your code, um, but not quite the central tool that we could um, uh, offer for our internal stakeholders. And then there are some startups uh, in this space, uh, Soda, Monte Carlo, Great Expectations. Again, a lot of them focus, uh, focused on um, batch data more than stream data, but we needed something that addressed both of these key data sources that we were using within Expedia. But they have, they're not libraries, so the, the three products, they're not libraries. They have cloud services that you can actually use to centrally monitor. So it's fairly more sophisticated than the, the libraries at the top. But internally, in the absence of a centralized quality, uh, um, data quality capability or tool, as I mentioned, we were shipping data products um, at the same time simultaneously. So there were some homegrown options. Um, and these varied from something that was very rudimentary all the way to very sophisticated and normally detection driven um, product based on how big is your team and how skilled are they in, in this space. Um, so some of these were, as I mentioned, using the open source libraries and baking it into the pipeline, um, or just do manual validations in your code because you know exactly what kind of things would trip your pipeline up, um, or run offline checks on just a sample of data and cross your fingers that everything else is fine, or shoehorn the metrics um, that's emitted from the pipeline into an APM or other monitoring tool like Datadog, um, or run manually. This is the most painful process, like manually check and uh, constantly observe Tableau dashboards. And I feel very sorry for the person who's actually in charge of doing that, um, because it's prone to a lot of human errors. Or have other bespoke um, homegrown solutions, as mentioned, uses um, Elasticsearch-backed metric store with um, Grafana dashboards or Kibana dashboards with anomaly detection. Um, again, these were very much tailored to that particular data product. They were not scalable. They were not usable, reusable by other products because the metrics that they were computing and calculating was very specific to one data product or data set in some cases. Um, but it was also becoming too much for a single team to um, manage and maintain and support and build up on, on top of their own product that they have got right, and work with stakeholders. So they can't quite justify the effort that was put in. Um, and also on the um, basic, very rudimentary implementation, it was lacking some of the key aspects that you would come to associate with um, a data quality tools, such as no monitoring, no alerting, no integration with PagerDuty, for example. So we embarked on building this platform um, tooling ourselves. So how did we do that? So there were four key stages, um, and they're all decoupled. We had um, the output of each stage streamed into the other so that we could dog food our own output, right? So we could run quality checks on, on the streaming data that we were calculating, like the metrics, um, which was great. And also, um, it enabled us to run these checks near real time. So they were fairly decoupled, and we used a stream-first approach here. So the first part is um, the ingestion. And as mentioned, Expedia has many, many sources of data, so we as a team, the central platform team. We're building for the most commonly used ones, which is Kafka and Data Lake. Um, but there were needs to do this on other sources of data as well. So we opened this up for inner sourcing. So we provided a pattern for how you um, plug into our, our tooling, but you come with your own um, ingestion part. So if you want to uh, hook it into Mongo database, you can write the ingester. So how you process the data, compute this metrics, 
we publish the contract. As long as you meet that contract and the metrics are calculated in a fairly consistent way, we are happy. The platform would take care of the, of the rest. Um, so um, yeah, so also on the on the ingestion side, um, so we did it on um, uh, Kafka and Hive. We used Apache Flink as the uh, processing tool to compute the um, the metrics, um, and we landed the data on on um, S3. We have about thousand streams, um, so we are looking at like billions of tens and billions of events per day and um, hundreds of terabytes of data per day to ingest this. And, and the nice aspect of it is we um, hooked this into our streaming platform capability, which is again another central Kafka infrastructure capability as well, which provide an automated onboarding. So whenever a customer created a stream, we would automatically onboard that data set onto the data quality platform as well. Uh, same way in the data lake, which is a completely different beast and which we personally learned through hard experience. You can't ingest the same way as stream. You'd think everything is data, but it's not. Um, so. So we even had to look at a completely different stack briefly to build our MVP because Flink didn't quite have the capability that we were looking at in processing partitions. So in Data Lake, as you know, data is partitioned by um, date or sometimes other or combination of columns that enables faster retrieval for analytics use case. So how you actually dealt with that data and in a, in a dynamic automated way was more complex to how you would process and ingest um, streaming data. But it was fun. So we built the ingestion for, for these two, which would then input that data. So as soon as it's consumed, um, this hooks into the next part of the, um, part of the, the tool, which is profiling. So this is a foundational part and the key part that unlocks the, the scaling aspect of, of this tool, because we can't, we quickly realized, and quite early on, um, thankfully, that you can't run checks on raw data directly, and especially at the scale that we were looking, and the tool would never scale, right? So you can't run, how many checks would you run? And that's, again, you have so many combinations of attributes, rows, and the data set also evolves over time um, as the domain evolves. So that was not going to be sustainable. So we went down the path of profiling the data, which is computing metadata out of your data. So you compute metrics, such as um, counting the number of rows, what's the number of events missing within a time window, um, how many nulls within the data. So you calculate these raw metrics out of the data. And then you can map these to the data quality dimensions that we talked about before quite easily. So as soon as you capture these metrics, um, there are so many different things that you can do. We'll, we'll come to that. So some of the profile metrics that we calculated was um, count of rows, how many missing, how many are populated, um, how many have null values, cardinality of each attribute, histograms, latency, um, event size uh, distribution, and um, statistical distribution of, of the values as well, like mean, median, mode. So we captured as much of these metrics, regardless of what use case we were solving, as possible as soon as we were ingesting, because we don't want to ingest this data again and again and again. So once we have computed this, uh, as I mentioned before, the data quality dimension is just a function of these metrics, right? Um, there is a huge value in just monitoring these metrics and alerting on these directly. You don't have to compute the dimensions um, in order to make use any use out of these. Um, as I mentioned, exploratory data analysis can be done on these um, profile metrics. Um, and you can also kind of derive metrics like what is the duplication ratio for a particular column. Uh, you can do all kinds of these combinations. Uh, it becomes even more valuable when you take a subset of the data where you segment a bigger data set like Clickstream and you divide it by point of sale or what is the um, uh, device from which this Clickstream data is collected and that becomes much more powerful when you run these data quality checks because it helps you to zoom in to what the cost of um, a, a core issue is. 
The next stage is um, running checks, and um, there were several ways and several different types of checks that we ran. The simplest one is setting a threshold um, on these metrics. Uh, you have upper and lower bounds, uh, or you can run rules whether a certain attribute is equal to, or a certain metric is equal to, greater than or less than. Um, and you can go like really crazy with anomaly detection models, use predictions um, to, to run those checks and detect anomalies in the data. Um, and uh, you can run pattern checks, like well, I expect the, the date to be of a certain format. Once you have profile, like these are the different formats that I'm seeing, you can run checks quite easily. Or the data types, um, you can run checks against that as well. And the last and the key stage um, of the tool is notification, because it's very important to hook this up to, um, to notify not just the stakeholders, but also people who are going to respond to these quality issues and respond timely. Um, so we had integration with Slack, email, page duty. We actually went one step um, further, because one of the key concerns from the stakeholders is how do we know that these alerts are actually valid or relevant, right? Because as I mentioned, there is a need to differentiate a genuine data drift to actual quality issue. And we actually achieved that by collecting feedback whereby any, anybody, an engineer or a data scientist or a stakeholder looking at the alert would tell us whether that was the right alert. And through this feedback, we would either retrain the model or reset the threshold at which these checks were triggering the alerts. Uh, there are so many different possible combinations that we could do off the back of that feedback. So it's quite powerful once you put these alerts in, in the hand of customers. So I'm coming up to the last part of, of this talk. Um, so it was a great experience building this and building this at scale. And there were quite a lot of these challenges at the technology level and the, the choices that we made. Um, but also at the organization level, um, it of course came with a lot of challenges, but opportunities as well. So it created transparency and trust on, on the data that we were calculating as we have never had before at the organization level. It was rewarding cleaner data practices because all of this dimension day metrics, it was available centrally for everybody to access in the, the data discoverability tool that we were using. Um, it was extendable as a platform capability, so people could contribute either to existing components or um, they could bring their own um, uh, plugin to ingest various different sources. It, it could even be reading from a file, right? But as long as we have built this in, in a platform way, um, we were unlocking that, that benefit immediately. And then there is the reusable metadata. The profile metrics that we were cal calculating wasn't just addressing the data quality problem. This was, again, available centrally for anybody to use for whatever purpose. If you want to put together your own dashboard, you could do that. Or if you want to build a product out of that for doing analysis, you could do that as well. Of course, there were challenges. Um, no, no. Challenges. So, yeah, so achieving and reliability and trust, not on the data, but on the tool that we were building. So that was a key challenge. Like, how do we know that the alerts that we were sending out was reliable? So is that actually good enough to wake somebody in the middle of the night? So that was hard fought and um, hard won as well. So at the engineering level, handling the different types of ingestion, was a challenge. There weren't a lot of tools out in the market for us to you know, adopt or even follow. And then anomaly detection was a challenge on its own because we were computing these um, metrics at uh, even if you take the streams, like thousands of streams and thousands of data like tables and pipelines, that a single model wouldn't cope with detecting anomalies at that level. And putting it together with the number of metrics we were calculating on the data set, at the record level, the column level, it was very challenging for us to just scale the anomaly detection part um, alone. Um, providing both subjective and objective measures, getting that definition standardized and agreed upon um, was 
was difficult and computing those and building a capability where you can define those objective measures um, and running those checks, again, another scaling problem, quite an interesting one to solve. And then finally, customization. So how do we customize these tools where you have a segment of data that you want to look at, not the whole data set, uh, but just a part of the data? Again, another issue that you have to build in a fairly common way that can be used, but very much subjective to what you're looking at. So on the whole, what do, what do I gain from, from this experience of um, you know, solving for data quality problem in the data mesh um, world. So a mature and centralized capability, the success of it can only be achieved if it is self-serve. So we had zero config um, policy. So we wanted customers to be able to onboard themselves onto this capability fairly easily. Um, and automation, right? So we provided programmatic way of um, integrating with this with this platform. Um, awareness of domain challenges, and we had to go and talk to all the data products, data owners, and munch all of that information before building this capability because we were addressing these domain challenges for them in a central way. Um, and also the diversity of the data that is available today in, in, in an organization at the scale of Expedia and solving that for that need um, was not a small problem. Consistency and standardization in the language, the metrics and the definitions was important and that was an exercise on its own. Um, and finally, I think this is, this is an important aspect here, right? So you can't do data mesh in isolation. As Zamax rightly pointed in her book, it's a socio-technical approach. It's an organizational shift. Um, it's not solved just by provide building something central and um, you're not doing data mesh in the way. So it's important that the teams, the data products, and these platform capabilities evolve together so that you can make success out of the data mesh pattern. So that's it. So all, all the information that I have coded or used, uh, including the definitions for dimensions, um, come from actually the top paper mostly, um, and all the data mesh from the two blogs and of course, Samax book. Um, but you can find more information about the products that I have referred to in these. Thanks. I'll be around for questions later. Thank you so much.